Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today we're going to talk about quantum encryption in space. So you might have heard about this Chinese satellite, the Quantum Experiments at Space Scale, which has demonstrated quantum communications over at uh, about 1,200 kilometers between two base stations in China. And, uh, well, you know, if you've been a fan of sci-fi, you may have heard about entangled photons and it's quite a common trope, actually. It's a surprisingly common trope in sci-fi for uh, uh, faster-than-light communications to use entangled photons because, of course, the cool thing about entangled photons is that they are one quantum state, and if you twiddle one side, then the other side instantly reacts. Not to burst your bubble or anything, but this doesn't actually work for faster-than-light communications, but it's still a cool trope. It's a really amazing piece of quantum mechanics. What's really happening when we're talking about quantum communications here is that the, we're actually talking about distributing encryption keys between two different participants in a conversation so that they can then communicate securely via another medium. So a big part of encrypted communication comes down to how Alice and Bob, the two participants in a communication, can get an encryption key that they can both agree on so that they can then communicate securely without Eve listening. Eve being the eavesdropper. Now, if you send an encryption key across the wire in plain text, then Eve could simply pick that up and then follow any subsequent communications. Uh, so you might think that, uh, say, in the world of military or banks or whatever, the encryption keys might get passed around, say, using... Uh, armed bodyguards with briefcases that are locked and, you know, scary things like that. But your computer, every day it is connecting to a secure website. It is having to establish a new secure encryption key between the two ends. And uh, they typically do this using something called public key cryptography. And that is basically a mathematical trick whereby Alice and Bob can exploit the properties of mathematics to uh, share some data that allows them both to come up with an encryption key, but if Eve tries to take the data that's on the wire and turn it into a usable encryption key, that would take a ridiculous amount of processing power. So quantum key exchange uses quantum mechanics to exchange a key which is um, in such a way that you can tell whether an eavesdropper is listening. The first quantum key exchange algorithm is called BB84. It is not BB8's big brother, no, it's called BB84 because it's a paper written by Charles Bennett and Giles Brassard in 1984. And this used, uh, uh, this used two, well, it was uh, used a single photon generator and a single photon detector. And the idea is Alice would send photons across the wire to Bob and Bob would receive those in such a way that they could uh, then figure out that the message was secure. Okay, so you've probably heard that light has a quality called polarization. Light is an electrical wave and a magnetic wave. And these are at 90 degrees to each other. Now, the phase of these um, oscillations depend, tells you how the light is polarized. If the things, if the electric field and the magnetic field are, are uh, exactly in phase, then they will oscillate in, at, in a linear manner like that. If they are out of phase, then you'll get a linear polarization at 90 degrees to that. And if they are in the, another phase, they could generate a circular polarization in either left or right orientation. But Point is that depending upon how the light is sent, you could have it in a plane and you could encode, use that to encode data. So you could encode light so that if it's oscillating in one direction, that is sending a one. And if it's oscillating at 90 degrees to that, you could call that a zero. So it's immediately obvious that you could communicate, right? So you could send a series of ones and zeros by swapping the polarization around. Now, of course, how would you detect this? You would have a detector with a polarizer filter in front of it, and the polarizer would either pass the photon through or reject it, and you could count a one or a zero one way or another. What happens 
if the photon is oscillating at 45 degrees, well, between your at at zero degrees to the filter, you would have 100% acceptance. And as you go down to 90 degrees, you would get zero acceptance. And somewhere in between 45 degrees, you would have a 50-50 chance. This is a quantum mechanical process, right? It's either it has to pass the photon or it has to reject the photon. There's no half photon getting through. The BB84 system, what this recognizes is that if you want to send photons as ones or zeros, you could equally send photons as ones and zeros in this configuration, right? And depending upon how you oriented the filter, it would work correctly for filter was oriented in the same base that you were sending the photons, but it would not work correctly if you were had your filter oriented at 45 degrees to that, or any other angle for that matter. So the protocol works by Alice sending a series of ones and zeros, but also when she's deciding to send a one or a zero, she decides whether to encode it at zero degrees or at 45 degrees. Now on the other end, Bob is receiving these and he doesn't know what orientation Alice is using for each photon. Alice is supposed to change it randomly. And so Bob, best he can do is pick randomly. So he picks randomly and some photons he will detect correctly. Other ones will hit the filter at 45 degrees and it will be basically 50-50 chance of getting a one or a zero. Now, after the two have sent a number of photons and received a number of photons, they can then reveal publicly what orientations were used for each photon. So Alice tells Bob what she sent the data as. Bob tells Alice what he listened as. And now both of them know which ones match up. So they can throw away all the photons where they didn't agree. And Bob now has a collection of photons which have been received correctly. And these photons could then be used as a cryptographic key. But what happens if Eve is listening in? Well, Eve is gonna do the same thing. For each photon, Eve has to decide, doesn't know in advance whether it's gonna be 90 degrees or zero degrees or 45 degrees. And if Eve gets it wrong, basically destroys the photon, destroys the information. So after this uh, initial collection of data and the throwing away of the bad data, Alice and Bob can then select a subset of their newly select or newly created bits and then compare those. And if they don't agree, that means there's some sort of noise on the line that is re reducing the quality of the data or possibly an eavesdropper. So if the noise level, if the number of errors get too high, then they can essentially throw away the data and start again because they know the line is being predicted. So the fact is that you're sending these single photons and Eve can't reliably pick them up without destroying the signal or at least without signaling that Eve is listening on the line. So anyway, there are existing crypto systems that use this. Um, you know, commercial crypto systems that are able to send data up to about 100 kilometers like this. The fundamental limit with these is that as you send the photons down the wire, there's a chance that they undergo some other interaction that destroys their phase information and therefore the error rate starts to rise. Now, the entangled photon system, that's a different protocol. That's called E91. And I think it's Arthur Eckert who came up with this. And instead of using a single photon generator, Alice or Bob, a third party uses a quantum, an entangled photon generator. How an entangled photon generator works is you send an intense laser beam through a special crystal. And sometimes two of the photons in the laser beam will interact with the crystal and be deflected out. And because they've undergone this quantum interaction, both photons uh, describe this complete quantum state. So one and the other don't individually describe it, both of them together describe it. So if one of them, uh, if you measure one, the other then falls into the correct state. So now these entangled photons then get sent off, one to Alice and one to Bob. Again, Alice and Bob 
do this same uh, reading system where they pick random orientations for their detector after they've received enough photons, Alice and Bob once again communicate over a public channel what orientations they used. Where they agreed on their orientations, they now know those are good photons. And then of course they can go on and measure the error rates and figure out if Eve was somewhere along the line messing around with the photons and introducing local realism to the quantum system, making it break. So that's what this satellite is doing. The satellite is essentially has a, an entangled photon generator on board and these photons are going off to two base stations. They were generating something like 6 million photons per second and it turns out they were maybe gener detecting like one entangled photon pair reliably every second. So the data rates are very, very low compared to systems that are already deployed on the Earth. But the big advantage is they were dealing with base stations thousands of kilometers apart. I believe that they were talking uh, 1,200 kilometers was the average. It, the satellite, incidentally, could only be used for a very limited time each day. It had to be in a position where both base stations could see it, and the satellite had to be in the dark because the sunlight reflecting off the satellite was enough to swamp the signal and ruin it. So this is a big step forward, and I just saw another result today where a team at the Max Planck Institute demonstrated that an existing communication satellite with a laser system on board was able to send quantum information to a ground station. So this is a satellite that wasn't built for the purpose, but has demonstrated that its hardware is capable of doing. And that's interesting, of course, because in space, you really want to fly hardware that has been well tested. So that if they don't have to verify new flight hardware, that makes the process of developing the satellite a whole lot faster and easier. So yeah, I think that roughly sets things out. It is an interesting time to be around. And uh, yeah, obviously, it's a continual battle between the people writing the encryption systems and the people snooping on those encryption systems. You know, these systems may be provably secure in a quantum manner, but uh, there's always other points in the chain where they could be attacked and hacked and things like that. So yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see how these things go. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.